Hi, runners. Thank you for watching this video. So this is a shortened Reader's Digest version of the longer video that I did about how at 43, I finally qualified for the Boston Marathon. I'm going to try to make this just five minutes. So um, tip number one, increase your weekly mileage. So I've been running marathons for 15 years. And um, when I first started training for my first three, I was running four to five days a week. And I had on Saturdays, I would do a long run of 20 plus miles. Um, but I had a lot of mileage, mileage during the week as well. After I had children and I started training again, I was training primarily by myself. I was only running three days a week. And on Saturdays, I would run a long run of 20 miles. And I just wasn't hitting my goal paces. And I didn't know why or my goal times. And I was feeling terrible on the marathon and on my long run. So the number one tip to accomplish your goals is you have to increase your weekly mileage and your days. You have to, I think, run five to six days a week. Um, number two is make 80% of those runs easy. This is huge and it seems counterintuitive to run slower than you wanna run your marathon at. That's why it took me years and years and years to buy into it. It took a doctor, <laughs> Tommy Rivers Pusey on my AFIT to convince me why I needed to run easy. Because if you're running easy, your body can recover and you're still getting the aerobic benefits that you need to carry you through a marathon. An easy pace run is 75% below your max heart rate. So for me, that's about a 138. That's one way to tell if you're running easy. Another way to tell is, can you carry on a conversation? If you're not running with somebody, can you run with your mouth closed and just breathe through your nose? Those are indicators that you're running easy. So it's not necessarily based on a pace, but more of a feeling, but you can use pace as your guidance. Um, number three, find a plan that supports your goals. For me, my new goals were to run more and to make sure whatever plan I had, 80% of the mileage was easy. And um, to make sure that I can fit the plan around my lifestyle of being a full-time working parent and um, a mother of two children, well, full-time working parent. So um, I looked in the Hansen's Marathon Method and people had a lot of success with it, but its advanced plan was way too advanced for me, requiring, I think, like 70 miles a week. I just can't do 70 miles a week. I could physically, but I just can't with my lifestyle. So I actually emailed the author, Lou Comfrey, and I said, hey, um, what plan do you suggest? So this book has a lot of plans, uh, but Final Surge is an app or a website that you can go to. And he has a ton of different types of plans on Final Surge. So I emailed him and I said, what plan? And he gave me a plan from Final Surge that I purchased for $40. It was the best investment in my running I've ever made other than my treadmill and the iFit app, which I go into more detail on the longer video. Uh, but so he suggested a beginner plan where I had two SOS days a week. Um, SOS stands for something of substance. I was six days a week of running. One of those runs would be a, a speed run, a speed workout. And then another run on Saturday would be an endurance run mixed with some tempo into it. So that worked for me. So it was a six day plan. Four of my runs were easy. Two were hard, marathon paced, focused, or a bit faster than marathon paced. That is the plan that finally worked for me and finally got me to qualify for Boston. Um, number five, make it a long term goal. Don't think, oh my gosh, I tried once and I didn't make it, boo-hoo, no. Like think about it as a long-term, it might take me five years, it might take me 10 years, but I don't care, I'm gonna keep working at it because it's consistent. The consistency is going to eventually get you there. So don't feel like you're not physically able to do it because you, you may not do it on the first three or four times. You may have to keep trying and that's okay. But just know that you're getting better and cons consistency is really what the key is. You keep running and you keep consistent. So, you know, it could be a five-year plan. It could be a 10-year plan. And, and once I reframed my thinking to that, um, I started to enjoy running again. And I, and I didn't have so much pressure on myself to qualify because I knew that one day I would. I was determined. Um, tip, next tip, tip number six is, I don't know what tip I'm on now. Um, no, I'm on number five. Pick a course that aligns with your goals. Pick a course that aligns with your goals. Don't say, I'm going to qualify for Boston. I'm going to run New York. 
I'm not saying that you can't run New York and qualify for Boston. I'm just saying you're making it much, much more difficult on yourself. New York's a big race. It's a crowded race. It's an exhausting race. I ran it. It was my first marathon. I think I was on my feet 13 hours the day before the race, just trying to get my number. It was terrible. The race was amazing. I highly recommend it, but it's a dessert race. And when I say dessert marathon race, it's when you really want to enjoy and you want to soak everything in. So you don't want to be, you don't want to put a time constraint on that because you won't enjoy it. If you have all this time pressure, you won't see the beauty that is the New York marathon. So run New York for dessert, like the big ones, I would suggest the world majors, like maybe not if you do great, if you qualify, but don't really push on those races to qualify. Um, findmymarathon.com or find my race. It's one of the two. They have courses. Um, you can check out the course, see what percentage of people qualify for Boston, how big the race is, if it's a qualified course or not, or if it's a certified course, not a qualified course. Um, and I found what works for me are these little races. Revel Canyon races work for me. I do fairly well on hills. And um, I've always been pretty successful with Revel races. And they're kind of designed to help people qualify for Boston. They have a huge percentage of people who run the races who do qualify for Boston. But I also think that people who do run Rebel races, their goal is to qualify for Boston, as opposed to other races where people are just running marathons just to run. They don't really have a time goal. I think most people that want run Rebel races do. And I think that also contributes to the high percentage of people that qualify for Boston. So if you're picking a race, pick a local race. I wouldn't suggest traveling, changing time zones because it's exhausting. In my 20s, I can do that. In my 40s, I can't. If I travel to a race, I'm exhausted before the race even starts. And I, I can't, I don't sleep well. Now you're changing my time zones and it's crowded. I don't know where to go. So I would suggest staying local or somewhere within driving distance or a one hour flight where you're not changing time zones. Um, make sure it's a fairly flat course and it's not too crowded right? Because a lot of these bigger races, it takes you a while to build momentum because of the crowds. So that would be my suggestion on picking a course that aligns with your goals. Fall races, I won't do fall races anymore. It's too hot, no matter where you go. It used to be, you know, guaranteed pretty good weather on the East Coast, and that's not the case anymore. Chicago was hot this year. When I ran Chicago in 2007, it was super hot. Um, it was canceled halfway through. Um, this race that I ran, it was unseasonably warm, 84 degrees when I finished. I probably could have finished faster if it wasn't for the heat. I don't do well in heat. Fall races are not my thing. Certainly summer races are. I really try to find races now in the early spring. That's my, it's my running season, early spring. So think about that when you register for a race, check out the average temperatures and all. And you know, what is average anymore? I don't know. It, it seems to be getting hotter and hotter. I used to run in pants and, uh, ear warmers and gloves. And I can't tell you the last time I took those out. I'm running in shorts right now. It's middle of November. So anyway, weather is changing, whether you like it or not, find a race that typically has really good weather. Um, tip number six is protein. Protein is really important and carbs, of course, but especially right after you finish a run. Tommy told me this too. This is a Tommy hat, by the way, Tommy Rivers Pussy, which I talk about in more detail in my other video but protein within 15 to 45 minutes after you run. Really important for your recovery. Um, I would just come home sometimes and just drink some milk. Milk has a lot of protein. It also has a lot of carbs. Add some chocolate to it. Chocolate milk's really good for recovery. Um, <clears throat> or a protein shake with fruit and protein powder, but some type of protein 15 to 45 minutes after you run. I used to not do that. I used to grab a cup of coffee and then head out to work and I would eat around 11. I wonder why I was tired all the time on my runs. That's why. Um, tip number seven, pick good shoes. Shoes matter now more than ever. Every shoe brand has a super shoe. Nike has their Alpha Fly. Um, Saucony has their Endorphin Pro and Speedline. Asics has some crazy one too, but every shoe company has a super shoe. Use it. You know why? Because everyone else is. Find one you like, spend the money, and run in it a few times before race day and then use it on race day. So um, because people's times are decreasing because of these super shoes, you should too. It's not cheating. 
If you're not sure what to get, check out some videos by Run Like Heller because she's hilarious and she has some great shoe reviews and there's not a lot of females that do shoe reviews. So she's a good one to watch if you want an honest shoe review. And now I'm crazy. I buy shoes all the time. Is this one better than that one? Da, 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 da. I don't know. Anyway, buy some good shoes. Um, number eight, sleep. Really important. Sleep, sleep, sleep. I don't sleep well. <sighs> so I, when I was marathon training, I'd be in bed by nine. Sometimes I wouldn't fall asleep till 10. And if I wasn't asleep by 10, my rule of thumb was, we'll just take a melatonin. And I would. Um, but one of the things I did to, I have to wake up 5 a.m. in the morning to run before work. So I have to be at work by eight o'clock. And I have to get my kids off to school. It's crazy, as you know. Um, but one thing I did is on Tuesdays, I would do my speed work and I would do that after work. So that allowed me, I would wake up at 5 a.m. on Mondays and run with my friend. Thank God I had a friend to run with, but she wasn't training for a marathon. She was just my easy pace friend. She's really fast too, by the way. Um, and then on Tuesdays after work, I would do my speed workout. So then I can kind of sleep in Tuesday morning. I didn't have to wake up at 5 a.m. to run. I could wake up around 6.30. And then Wednesday was my off day. So then I would sleep until about 6.30 on Wednesdays too. Thursday's 5 a.m., Friday's 5 a.m., Saturday and Sunday. Again, I ran around my neighborhood, so I was never getting up driving anywhere to do my long runs. So that was three days a week where I was forcing myself out of bed. I think that really helped. So find those little cheats that you can find where you can find them. And for me, that was having a speed day. Um, that I would do in the late afternoon after work. And then I would have an off day the next day because I didn't want to run in the evening and then run the next morning. It's not enough time in between. So um, number nine, your monthly cycle, your period. Ooh, taboo, period. I said period. Yes, I did. That's what it's called. Um, it matters. So the there's a book about it called Roar. Name, yeah, the title is Roar, but it talks all about that. But um, typically for me, the best times to run a race are um, two weeks after my period. The week before my period and the week of my period are not great for me. So it's like, great, I have two solid weeks where I'm like, really going to run well. I hope my marathon falls in line with that. Uh, when I ran Rebel Canyon Big Bear, when I did qualify for Boston, um, two weeks prior to, I had my last 10-mile tempo and I did a local race. And I couldn't even hold on to an 8.30 pace. And I was like, oh my gosh, I can't even hold on to an 8.30 pace. It was the day before my period. I was dying. And I thought, how am I going to run a marathon in two weeks? I can't even get through this 10-mile race. Um, and then I ran my marathon two weeks later in 3.38 and held an 8.20 pace for 26.2 miles. And I was singing until mile 19, until the heat came. And it just melted me and destroyed me and all the demons came out. Uh, you know, your mental demons that tell you you can't do it and you're a big loser. So those came out to play at the last 10K. Um, but I still Boston qualified. So anyway, just take that. Be patient with yourself the week before and the week of your period. If your times aren't fast, oh, well, it's your body. Your body's just not having it. Nothing you can do about that. Um, and then expect that there's going to be a few failed attempts. Um, expectation is the thief of joy right? So if you expect you're going to qualify for Boston every time and you don't, it's just going to ruin your whole race experience. Go out there, do the best you can, control your training, what you can, and whatever race day delivers, it delivers. Marathon running owes us nothing um, and still try to enjoy it regardless of the outcome. I mean, you ran a freaking marathon, right? That's huge. And a lot of people can't say that and they probably don't want to say that. People are like, I never want to do that. So those are my 10 tips for how to, on how to qualify for Boston. So yes, I did Rebel Canyon Big Bear woo, and um, I ran it 338. So my qualifying time was a sub 340 and I missed the 2022 cutoff by a day. It closed, on, <laughs> that's just my luck. It closed on November 12th. My race is on November 13th. And I was like, well, I wouldn't have made it into 2022 anyway. I didn't have a big enough buffer. Well, they took everyone for 2022. So I would have made it in. But anyway, I'll put in for 2023. And funny enough, I'll be 45 in 2023. So my qualifying time is actually 350. So I'll have like an 11 minute buffer. So I feel like I should definitely get in. So I'm pretty excited about that. 
Anyway, those are my quick 10 tips on how to qualify for Boston. I do have a longer version of this video, but I know thanks to TikTok and Instagram, we have no attention span anymore. So I try to make this quick and not super boring. So thank you for listening. Happy running. If you have any questions, you can find me at Lefty Tiff on Instagram. I have about five followers. No, it's, it's a private account, but anyway, message me and I would totally answer you and let you in. Um, so yeah, none of this is sponsored. I'm not that important. It's just, these are things that help me. Tommy helped me. Rebel Canyon Races helped me. Hanson's helped me. Um, my Garmin watch helped me, although it yells at me all the time. It tells me my runs were unproductive and I slept like crud, but other than that, it's, it's been a good friend. So happy running. And I hope you qualify for Boston. Don't give up.